December 2017, and the disclosed presence of Jesus Christ. We are now at the end of the age of the Messiah, the Church Age. God is choosing an elect company, out from more than seven billions of earth, to bear his name. The very word, church, means, the called out. These are ones who are now being called out of sin, called out of the kingdom of darkness, called out of the world, called out of Babylon's religious systems, called out of every nation, called out of the Gentiles, called out of Israel until there is a multitude singing a new song. When anticipating this long, marvelous and awaited event, we need to know and understand the significance of all the biblical feasts, for we ought to be ready, waiting, and watching for his call out. It was winter and Jesus was in the temple area walking in Solomon's colonnade. At that time the Feast of Hanukkah, also known as the Feast of Dedication or of the Lights, took place at Jerusalem. The Feast of Dedication is a Jewish holiday commemorating the rededication of the Second Temple in Jerusalem at the time of the Maccabean Revolt against the Seleucid Empire. In the year 530 BC, the prophet Daniel, incidentally, wrote about Hanukkah. In a prophetic vision from God, he saw the conflict between God's people and the devil. The telling of it, and the victories that followed have become the story of Hanukkah. Daniel was given the amazing prophecy over 300 years before the events of Hanukkah began. In Daniel 8, he gives us the details. He says that a ram with two horns, made of Persia, ruled with great power. Then a goat, Greece, with a prominent horn, Alexander the Great, came and overpowered the ram. Then the horn was broken, Alexander died, and in its place four powerful horns emerged, four Greek kingdoms. Out of one of the horns came a small horn, Antiochus Epiphanes. He was a demonized man, possessed by an antitrust spirit. He rose up against the beautiful land, Israel. He reached the heights of heaven, and threw down some of the stars. He overpowered God's people and killed many of them. With satanic intent, he set himself up, above the Prince of Princes, the Lord God. He took away the daily sacrifice in the temple and truth was cast to the ground. He set up a statue of Zeus in the temple, but with his own face on it. He offered pig's blood and urine as the sacrificial offering and had it poured forth repeatedly in the Holy of Holies. This was the temple of the living God. David had been commanded to build this as a house for the Lord. Many Jews were tortured and then murdered because they refused to worship the image. In the town of Madin, 17 miles northwest of Jerusalem, an altar was built to honor Zeus. An old priest named Metatias Maccabee was told to sacrifice a pig on it. The Jews, who had been commanded to gather, would then be forced to eat its flesh. Metatias and his sons could take it no longer. They rose up with indignation, killed the soldiers, and the famous Maccabean Revolt began. Six battles in three years later, upheld by many miracles, and against all odds, the Jews defeated their enemies. In 164 BC, they cleansed the temple and gave it back to the Lord. The statue was smashed and God's house was purified. The priests were determined to light the menorah but they refused to burn polluted oil in it. 
It took eight days to prepare oil for the lamp, and they only had enough for one day. They lit it and it stayed lit for eight days. Hanukkah is the Feast of Miracles. It all begin with Daniel's prophecy so Hanukkah really is a Bible story. Because of the Hanukkah story, the Jews were not annihilated and the door remained open for the birth of our Lord. He is the light of the world. The message of Hanukkah is more than a story about the past. It is also a living prophecy that points to the path of Christ's second coming. Now Haggai is one of the shortest book in the Old Testament. Haggai's prophecy consists of four messages from God delivered to the nation, after the rebuilding of the temple had ceased for about ten years. The immediate purpose of the book is to encourage the people to resume the building of the temple, which had been incomplete for about ten years. It was imperative that the people built the temple, for blessing from God depends on obedience. The primary theme is the rebuilding of God's temple, which had been lying in ruins since its destruction by Nebuchadnezzar in 586 BC. By means of messages from the Lord, Haggai exhorted the people to renew their efforts to build his house. He motivated them by noting that the drought and crop failures were caused by misplaced spiritual priorities. But to Haggai, the rebuilding of the temple was not an end in itself. The temple represented God's dwelling place, his manifest presence with his chosen people. The destruction of the temple by Nebuchadnezzar followed the departure of God's dwelling glory. See Ezekiel chapters 8 through 11. To the prophet Haggai, the rebuilding of the temple invited the return of God's presence to their midst. Using the historical situation as a springboard, Haggai reveled in the supreme glory of the ultimate messianic temple yet to come encouraging them with the promise of even greater peace, prosperity, divine rulership, and national blessing. Haggai 2, 6 and 7, says, For thus says the Lord of hosts, once more, in a little while, I am going to shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I will shake all the nations, and they will come with the desirable and precious things of all nations, and I will fill this house with glory and splendor, says the Lord of hosts. This passage links the shaking or great earthquake to the coming of the desire of all nations, a phrase that must mean the return of the Lord as the Messiah or Prince of Peace. This being the desire of all godly people in the nations, though obviously not the desire of the wicked on the earth at the time of his return. This conclusion is reinforced with the idea that the Lord's house will be filled with glory, surely an indication of both a divine reign as well as an allusion to the house of David from which the Messiah's royal lineage comes. Now Haggai may give us a fuller picture of these end-time events. Indeed, Haggai 2:18 through 23 gives an exact season and day for this event, but obviously not the calendar year. 18. Consider from this day onward, from the 24th day of the ninth month, since the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider, 19. Is the seed yet in the barn? Do the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, and the olive tree still yield nothing? From this day on I will bless you. 20. The word of the Lord came a second time to Haggai on the 24th day of the month, 21 
speak to Zerubbabel, Babel, governor of Judah, saying, I am about to shake the heavens and the earth. 22. And to overthrow the throne of kingdoms, I am about to destroy the strength of the kingdoms of the nations, and overthrow the chariots and their riders, and the horses and their riders shall go down, every one by the sword of his fellow. 23. On that day, says the Lord of hosts, I will take you, O Zarudbabel my servant, the son of Shealtiel, says the Lord, and make you like a signet ring. For I have chosen you, says the Lord of hosts. This date, the 24th day of the ninth month, is of interest because it occurs just one day before Hanukkah. Anywhere else, such timing would seem rather an odd coincidence. With God, things are different. As we do believe, there's no such thing as an odd coincidence when it comes to Bible prophecy. As the events predicted did not transpire historically, the promise pertains to the royal line through which the Messiah would come. It looked to the ultimate day when Messiah reigns on earth. See Psalms 2 and Revelation chapters 19 and 20. In Haggai 2.20, when God spoke through the prophet, this was another separate time, on the same day as the last, but with a separate message. In verse 21, this message is directed to the prince over them, to support him under all the changes and revolutions made in the world. This message is for Zerubbabel personally. We see that it is not a world power that God is speaking of shaking the heavens and earth, but of himself. That he should be regarded by the Lord in a very tender manner, and his government continued, as a type of Christ in his kingdom. He will make great commotions, changes, and revolutions in the world, by wars, and otherwise the Persian kingdom being subdued by the Grecian, the Grecian by the Romans, the Roman Empire by the Goths and Vandals, and the anti-Christian states, by the vials of God's wrath poured out upon them, by means of Christian princes. Isaiah 13, 13 says, Therefore I will make the heavens tremble, and the earth will be shaken out of its place, at the wrath of the Lord of hosts in the day of his fierce anger. In verse 22, he prophesies about the Persian monarchy, which consisted of various kingdoms and nations, and was destroyed under Darius Codemanus by Alexander the Great, who fought with him three pitched battles and overcame him. But the thing was of the Lord, according to his purpose and will, and by his power and providence. And therefore, the overthrow is ascribed to him. The Jews say that the Persian monarchy fell by the Grecians 34 years after the building of the temple. But it lasted longer. Then came the empire of Alexander, which was a very strong one and contained in it many kingdoms and nations, even the whole world, at least as he thought, and which was divided after his death into several kingdoms, the strength of which was greatly weakened by one another, and at last entirely destroyed by the Romans' instruments. But this may be applied to all the kingdoms of this world which will all be demolished, and be brought into subjection to Christ. And his kingdom shall be set up in the world, the son and antitype of Zerubbabel, of whom the following words are to be understood. See Daniel 2.44 God was showing Zerubbabel, that even though some country actually attacks, it is the finger of God in operation. God uses countries to carry out his wishes. 
they are but pawns in his hand. God is all-powerful. He has control of everything and everyone. God will cleanse the earth by destroying the heathen nations that are opposed to God and his people. In verse 23, Zerubbabel, as God's signet ring, stands as the official representative of the Davidic dynasty and represents the resumption of the messianic line interrupted by the exile. Just as Pharaoh gave Joseph his signet ring and made him second in the kingdom, so God will do for the Davidic line of kings, which would culminate in the everlasting reign of Jesus Christ. Without doubt this is said concerning the expected Messiah, who will be of the seed of Zerubbabel. And therefore this promise was not at all fulfilled in him. For in the time of this prophecy he was but governor of Judah, and he never rose to greater dignity than what he then had. Zerubbabel is dedicated to the service of God. His signet seals him as having power and authority from God. God appreciated the trust and faithfulness Zerubbabel had shown in building the temple. God makes him the signet to show his trust in him. The signet ring was the power of attorney to use the authority of the one who gave it. In this, Zerubbabel was a type and shadow of Jesus Christ. God gave Jesus Christ the signet of being his right hand. And Jesus Christ promises to his true church, in Revelation 2, 26 and 27, he who conquers and who keeps my works until the end, I will give him power over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as when earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as I myself have received power from my Father. Now let us get back to John 10 and to Jesus Christ and the Feast of Dedication. Then when the Jews gathered round Jesus and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness to me. But you do not believe, because you do not belong to my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, and no one shall snatch them out of my hand. John 24 b through 28 He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Revelation 2.29 Amen.